Um, well, first, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning at VLP for this month's webinar on the College Search with Cozy Whitman. My name is Sarah Avila, and I am a financial advisor here at VLP. If you're attending one of our webinars for the first time, welcome, and thank you for joining us. For those of you that re are returning, welcome back, and thank you for your continued trust in our firm. As a reminder, before we get started, um, please do keep your lines muted. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box as you think of them. There's a couple of question breaks throughout the presentation where our speaker will answer those questions for you. And then if time permits at the end, um, we can also address um, additional questions at the end. <clears throat> so I did wanna provide a little bit of information about who we are uh, for those of you that are new to VLP or new to our monthly webinar series. VLP is a financial planning and wealth management firm located in Vienna, Virginia, though we work with clients nationwide. Our goal is to be a trusted partner to the individuals, families, and businesses that we serve. In the last 30 years, we've grown from a two-person firm to a team of 21 and counting, which includes seven certified financial planners, five accredited investment fiduciaries, two chartered financial analysts, and a certified divorce financial analyst. Today, our advisors have a collective experience of well over 100 years, and we celebrate being recognized by the Washingtonian and Northern Virginia Magazine as top advisors, an honor that we've held for over a decade. <laughs> Today, I am joined by Cozy Whitman from College Inside Track, um, as an education and partnership leader at College Inside Track, College, uh, Co Cozy Whitman speaks nationally about college search, educating families and training financial advisors. College search has become increasingly complex. The nuances are hard to understand. Cozy's passionate about dispelling myths that cost families money. She's been featured in the Journal for Financial Planning on the subject of college planning. Cozy is excited to connect with organizations and families interested in learning more about the complex college search process. She's a mom of five kids with very different goals for college, so she is no stranger to the challenges around college search. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Cozy. Cozy, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can uh, bring up your presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody for carving some time out of your day today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name's Cozy Whitman. Um, I might add to my, my bio, I should probably add it to the end. My kids have all successfully launched now. So uh, not only did we get them in, but they got out. Uh, so it's super exciting at our household. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, College Inside Track. We have been helping families navigate the college search process for 18 years now. I have to change my slide. Um, we do help families find right fit schools for their students, and we would identify fit as the right academic fit for your student, the right social fit for your student, and the right financial fit for your family. Uh, and then if you have a high school, and I'm assuming if you're joining today, you do, um, you know that college search can be kind of stressful. And so part of our job is to try and bring down that stress level through the college search process. All right, we're going to kick today off with the quiz. This is a play at home kind of thing. As a percentage, how much do you think tuition has increased nationally at our public institutions in the last 30 years? So just tuition here. Do you think our public schools have increased their tuition by 73%, 106%, 180%, or 213%? I'll give you a second to uh, choose your answer. Turns out our public schools, these are our state colleges and universities have increased their tuitions by 213% nationally on average. By comparison, private schools have gone up 415% in that same time frame. But before you get out your wet noodles and start lashing those private schools for that outrageous increase, I just want you to take a quick peek at our public flagship universities. So these are the main university in their state. 
Um, I looked it up. UVA is in the 700% range. Um, these are some Midwest schools. These are the uh, some of the Big Ten schools because kids often tell me they want to go to the Big Ten um, uh, or the Big 12 or the SEC schools. Um, and I just want you to get a sense of uh, what schools look like. The highest I've found so far is University of Connecticut at 13 hundred percent. So our flagship universities, the UVAs of every state, have far surpassed their public peers and they have also far surpassed their private peers. Um, I want to point out uh, kind of uh, cost of attendance at schools today. I meet a lot of families that are like, we don't even know what college costs. And when I sit down and I chat college with families, which I do often, um, one of the things I always ask the student is, you know, tell me some schools you're kind of sort of interested in. And I'm here to tell you that your kids are bubbling up schools that fall in the same category as these top four or five schools. But what I want to point out in this slide are these bottom three. The bottom three schools of their states, uh, excuse me, the bottom three schools are the flagship schools of their states. And these schools, you can see well over the $30,000 a year mark. And I meet a lot of families where they're hoping to go to college for twenty dollars to $25,000 a year. And candidly, that's just not what college costs today. Um, now, could you find a very small state public institution in your state that hangs at the twenty-five, twenty-six dollars range? Yep, you totally could. Those are not typically the schools, though, that your kids are bubbling up for their hope and dream schools, right? So um, I just want to point out that there's a big disconnect today between what parents are hoping to pay and what college actually costs. And when we look at the flagship schools across the country, we do see that most of them are well over the $30,000 mark today. Uh, UVA, I think, hangs in the $33,000, $34,000. Um, and then there are some schools. Um, I live in the Midwest. University of Iowa is still under 30,000, but just barely. They're hanging on at 29. So in general, if you're planning for what should we pay for college, you should for sure be working with your uh, VLP financial advisor. But just count on it being likely over $30,000 a year. All right. I have another quiz for you. What percentage of students transfer at least one time? So they go off to a school that they chose, discover it's not really the school they were hoping it was going to be, and they have to change schools. Is that 6% of the time? Is it 14% of the time? 25% of the time? 38% or 42%? So these are the kids who go off to school, discover that they've chosen the wrong pathway and need to change schools. Well, it turns out today nationally, what we see is the transfer rate hangs out at 38%. Now, I bring this up because when you change schools, it increases the cost of the degree substantially. So um, I don't know very many people who are hoping to overpay for their college education. And so one of the best and easiest ways you can keep the price down is by helping your student do a better deep dive on the front side so they're only applying to schools that really fit them well. So that fit component becomes a key component to your search process. So when kids change schools just once, it increases the cost of that degree by $14,000. And guess what? Of the 38% who made a poor choice the first time, almost half of those kids 45% of those kids make a poor choice yet again and have to go on to another school, increasing the cost of their degree by $24,000. So right fit first time, that's what you're shooting for. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about financial aid because I find there's a lot of disconnect over how the colleges talk about financial aid and then how the parents think about financial aid. And there's a lot of conflating that happens and misperception around what's involved in the financial aid process. So when I sit down and I do family consultations, which I do every day of the week, um, one of the things we talk about is, you know, tell me the philosophy for paying for school. And people usually kick those off by saying something like, well, we're not going to qualify for financial aid. And what they actually mean is they're not going to qualify for need based aid, which is separate and apart from merit-based aid. 
These are um, given away for very different reasons. Need-based aid is based on the outcome of your financial aid forms. Merit-based aid, though, is based on the things of your student that the college finds interesting. So they are different buckets of money. Some schools have both. Some schools only have one. When colleges talk about financial aid, though, you should know that they are not just including these two. They are actually also including loans. So when you go out to college websites and the school website says something like, um, the average amount of financial aid that we give away is X, you should know that it includes all three of these. So if your family, if it's true um, that your family will not qualify for need-based aid, already the number they're sharing with you, incorrect for your family. And so what we find is the numbers that colleges share are often irrelevant to the families who are looking at those numbers. And so you have to get into the weeds today to really understand what it will cost your family on a specific campus. So we're gonna break these apart. We're gonna talk about two of the three. I'm not gonna to touch on loans today, um, but we will cover both need and merit aid. So there's a lot of misperception around need-based aid. Uh, people assume if I have a roof over my head, I'm not gonna qualify. Um, and candidly, that's untrue for a lot of families. Uh, but there are two forms that you may fill out um, to help a school determine if you qualify for need. And I wanna be really clear about that. You can qualify for need or not at the federal level but their determination is not the same as the college's determination. Each and every school makes their own mind up about whether or not you qualify. And so you could find yourselves qualifying for need-based aid at Case Western University, but not qualifying for need-based aid at University of Virginia or Virginia Tech. So um, two forms. Most people are familiar with the first. It certainly has held a lot of news coverage lately. It's called the FAFSA, of course. The second form you may not have heard of. Some schools use it, some do not. It's called the CSS profile. And in fact, some schools use their own financial aid forms that they ask you to fill out. These forms kick out a number today that is referred to as the student aid index. And it's the student aid index that the colleges use to determine if you have need. They take their sticker price, they subtract that student aid index number, and if there's a positive number left over, you qualify for need-based aid. So let's talk about how the FAFSA impacts cost. The first thing you should know is there are actually two parties involved in the FAFSA. So when you have a student going off to college, technically they own the FAFSA, but the FAFSA also wants your information as their parent. And so when we look at what parents have to share, the form wants to know about your income and your income is going to be assessed at 47%. Your assets by comparison are actually only gonna be assessed at 5.64%. So a lot of times people ask me questions around like, what would happen if we get rid of these assets or should we, I had a family who had um, land that had been in their family for decades, decades and decades, like 70 years or something. And they wanted to know, should they sh sell that land? I don't think anybody should do anything specifically for the purpose of FAFSA, right? Um, I think it's important to also understand that your assets, um, manipulating them will almost never change the outcome of your FAFSA by very much because look at the discrepancy here. Your income is the largest factor on this FAFSA, not your assets. Students, it's their form, so their information does need to be included, of course. And so um, their income is being assessed at 50% and their assets at 20%. The good news is most kids don't have much of either of these. And so technically um, their um, income and assets don't usually sway the outcome of the form. There are a couple things that you should know, though, and I want to give you kind of a deep dive behind the curtain, if you will, here. Parent income is the single largest factor on the FAFSA. And so unless you can manipulate your income, you almost never get the opportunity to manipulate the outcome of your FAFSA. You're either going to be need-based or you're not. 529 plans are considered a parent asset. So if you own a 529 plan, 
and your student is the beneficiary, it actually only gets assessed at that little 5.64%. And think about it this way, because sometimes people say to me like, ah, oh, we shouldn't have saved for school. We're going to be penalized now. I just want to point out that a 529 plan is intended for you to spend on college, right? So technically, 100% of that money is available for use for college, but it's still only going to get assessed at this teeny tiny 5.64%, even though 100% of it is available. And then um, I just want you to know, back in the day, like dinosaur days when I went to school, parents used to be able to just not claim their kids on their taxes, and that makes the student independent, right? Um, it actually doesn't work like that anymore. Um, to be independent on the FAFSA, there are seven very clear criteria. And I always joke that most parents of 18-year-olds do not want their kids in that position. Things like, you need to be married. Um, so the independent statures are intended for adult students. And so most 18-year-olds do not qualify. And then a um, couple things just to make sure that you do not include on your FAFSA. None of your retirement accounts go on the FAFSA, so that is not an asset that gets counted. And then don't include the value, the market value of your home, right? Um, you don't want to include your primary residence. Now, if you have some fun vacation residence someplace, you do have to include that. But you don't need to include your primary residence. And I'm, after this slide, I'm going to take questions. So if you have questions about the FAFSA, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll get those taken care of here. All right. So there are some big time FAFSA changes rolling out on the 2024 FAFSA. I'm sure you've heard about it in the news. Um, they've had all kinds of technical issues. They released the new FAFSA with known um, uh, discrepancies in the formula, things that were supposed to be included but were not. Um, and so they're in the process of fixing it. But I want to give you a heads up on some of the things that happened in this new FAFSA. So um, the first thing I mentioned already, if you have older students and you filled up the FAFSA before, the outcome of the old FAFSA was called the expected family contribution. That verbiage is now retired and in its place, the words student aid index or on your report that you get back, it will say SAI. So the first thing I want to point out is that families who have multiple kids in college, like me, <laughs> we had six years where we had multiple kids in college, um, that you will no longer kind of get credit, if you will, for having multiple kids in college. So the formula used to acknowledge the fact that you had multiple kids in college. It's no longer going to do that. So while the FAFSA itself still asks the question, how many kids do you have in college? It's not going to change the formula any longer. And what that means is um, that if you do not qualify for need-based aid when you have one student in college, you are not going to qualify for need-based aid once you have two. And that used to happen pretty frequently for middle and upper middle income class families. There's no question, no question this is going to make college more expensive. If you have divorce as part of your family structure, I just want to point out that the way you determine which family is going to fill out the FAFSA, because only one parent is going to do it. And the way you determine that is by determining which of the two parents is financially supporting the student more. Uh, now, here's the good news. The federal government did not bother to define financial support. So you guys get to make that determination. What does it mean to be financially supported? supporting the students. So make that determination and then that parent will be the parent who fills out your FAFSA form. Um, there were exemptions for assets for people who had small businesses and farming farmers. Um, those exemptions disappear. And so if you're a small business owner, you will need to include all of the assets of your business on your uh, FAFSA form now. And those will be assessed at that asset rate of 5.64%. So if you're a small manufacturer, any unsold merchandise, if you own your buildings, if the equipment, um, uh, all the capital equipment it takes to produce whatever it is that you make, all of those things, the um, value of those will need to be put on your FAFSA. And if you're a farmer, any land that is not part of your homestead, livestock, buildings, um, uh, you know, tractors, all of those things will now need to be included. 
And the one kind of big positive thing that came through this round in these FAFSA changes is that grandparents or any third party, so sub in here, um, auntie, uncle, godparents, neighbor next door who loves my kid and offered to pay for part of their school, anybody who wants to help your student pay for college can now do so. And it will not negatively impact any need-based aid that the student is getting. All right, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Sarah, do we have any questions? <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box right now, um, but I do have a question for you mm -hmm. uh, myself. So when they're assessing income, are they using the most recent previous year tax return or is there some other document they're using? Yeah, good question. So the way you figure out which tax year they're gonna pull is by looking at the year the FAFSA is for. So right now people are filling out the 2024, 2025 FAFSA and it will be the um, two year previous tax year. So on the 2024 FAFSA, they are using tax year 2022. When we get to year 2025, they'll be using 2023. And that's primarily because the FAFSA is available um, starting in October of that previous year and your current tax year is not done, right? You're still working on it. So that's why they decided to go back a year. Gotcha. And what's the deadline for filling it out each subsequent year? Yeah. So um, each college has their own deadline. And so families just need to be aware of what that looks like. Um, we recommend that people fill it out for the first time in fall of senior year and then just drop it on your calendar for every fall. Right. Make it an annual uh, reminder to just do it every single year. That makes it easy and gets it out of the way. Technically speaking, it must be filled out by June 30th um, of that um, previous year um, so that the schools can um, make the appropriate assessments for the coming fall, right? So, um, but pay attention to your school deadline because they're all different. Okay. And does the CSS profile also have to be filled out every year? Yes. Um, well, it depends on the school. Some schools only take one and then they never ask families to fill it out again. Uh, but other schools um, want it every single year as well. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat box. Sounds good. Yeah, so we can just kind of carry on and then the next break, we'll see if we have more. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, don't be shy, you guys, right? If you have a question, likely someone else on here is thinking that exact same thing. So uh, feel free, drop it in, happy to answer. Um, all right, we got, I have one more quiz for you. Uh, this one is a little bit more challenging, I think, than the other two. Um, of the options that I'm going to offer you, which of these paths do you think is the least expensive? Is it choosing a four-year public college? Is it starting at a two-year school and then transferring to any kind of four-year school? Is it starting at a public college and transferring to a private college, or is it starting at and finishing at a four-year private university? So I'm going to give you a sec here to think about this one, because this one's a little bit more tricky. All right, let's take a peek. It turns out all the above are true. They could be true depending on your student and your circumstances. So um, things that impact which of those might be your least expensive, where you live, the background of your student, your financial circumstances, the things that your student has done in school that will impact and bring scholarships to the table. Um, and then the way that the schools make decisions, all of those things will impact that such that there really is no one right path anymore. Right. I can't say to you, hey, and by the way, I was totally this mom. When we started our college searches back in the day, I didn't work for College Inside Track. I was just a mom. Um, I said to my kids, I don't care where you go as long as you stay in state and go to a state school. <laughs> right. Because I was quite sure that was going to be our least expensive path. Turns out I was wrong. Um, and I just want to point out so most people choose the most common response there is the B, right, starting at a two-year and transferring to a four-year, followed quickly by A, right, starting at and going to a public four-year university. Um, that transferability piece is really important because um, if your student goes to the local community college and they end up transferring to a school 
that there is a relationship between those two and all those credits get accepted, awesome. Then yes, that might be your least expensive path. But if they plan to start at the local two-year school and then transfer to some other school that has no relationship with that community college, then you're starting to see again that $14,000 increase to the total cost of your degree. It is not always cheaper to make that path. And in fact, today, what we see is if parents don't ditch the old way of thinking about schools, right, my way, stay in school, go to a state school, um, if you don't change the way you think, you are likely overpaying for your college education. Today, colleges are not public and private. They are flexibly priced and inflexibly priced because they're public and private in both of those two categories. So from a financial perspective, it really does not suit the landscape anymore for you to think public is always gonna be cheaper because it's not. Um, I live in the Midwest. Uh, I live in Minnesota. One of my kids went to University of Minnesota, our flagship school. One of my kids went to Drake University, a private school. And one of my kids went to University of Missouri, Kansas City, an out of state state school. The least expensive of those three was the private school, followed by the out-of-state state school, followed by our flagship university. That's right, staying in-state was the most expensive option for my kids. So I just want to point out, it is much less clear today how to really keep schools in your budget. Now, if you've saved well and you don't care about the price of college, that's awesome. I just don't know anybody who wants to kind of overpay for an undergrad degree. So it's important to just understand how this landscape works. And the number one question I get when I meet with families is tell us where we find scholarships, right? Or, hey, we've saved well, but gosh, we wouldn't be opposed to some scholarships. Um, and I wanna make sure you understand where they come from. Scholarships today, there's no magic box, right? So everybody thinks there's some magic box out here somewhere. The magic box actually sits at the colleges. The colleges are the number one source for scholarships that actually move the price of college. So when you think about how to build your college list, you want to find schools that align with who your student is, right? So if you've got uh, lots of people think, I don't have the 4.0 kid. So one, I don't even know if we can find schools they can go to, and two, um, for sure, they're not going to get any reduction because they're not the super sharpie kid. Um, and this is blatantly untrue. You just have to look for schools that are most interested in your style of student, right? And we're going to talk about what the schools are thinking about here in a slide or two. When colleges give away money, they give it in the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, right? Last year, our class for 2023 garnered more than $25 million dollars in scholarships at the colleges they apply to. The colleges are your source here. And when schools give away that money, it does typically last all four years. Number two on the list are colleges yet again. So you get the first round when your student applies, and then there's a whole other round of scholarships available to them after they've been accepted. So they get the email that says, congrats, you're a bear, a beaver, a gopher, a duck, or some other woodland creature. And in that email, there's a link to additional scholarship dollars often, right? And if it's not in the link, it's out on their website. And why do kids miss these? They're just not paying attention, candidly, or some of them don't read their emails, right? So these deadlines go by and your student never even applied for them. So it's important to keep that in mind. And again, when the colleges give away money, it typically lasts four years. And it's a much larger sum than local scholarships, right? So you'll notice, right, the pyramid getting smaller because the award amounts are getting smaller and the length that they last is getting smaller. So local scholarships are fine, right? It's fine to apply for these, right? Local bank, maybe a community group, um, maybe your employer, all of those are fine to apply to. You just have to know they aren't going to move the needle on college and they do typically only last one year. Right, so congrats, your student managed to scrape up a thousand bucks once. What we know from studies is in freshman year when they need to re-up and go out and look for more, guess what? They don't do it. And also they bought 
books basically for the year, right? If you're going to a school that's 30,000 a year, that thousand dollar scholarship amount, not really moving the needle here. So should you do them? Sure. Are they gonna change the price of college for you? No. And the bottom of the barrel, where I would recommend you spend exactly zero amounts of time, out on the internet looking for scholarships. This is where people think the magic box is, but it is not. This idea that there are millions of dollars of unclaimed scholarship money every year is urban legend. It's blatantly false. So if you're gonna focus on the internet, focus on searching for better schools that fit your student. So what should you be looking for? You wanna look for schools who A, even do merit aid. I mentioned earlier, there's right, need-based aid and merit-based aid, and some schools have both buckets, but some only have a need bucket, and that's it. There is no merit bucket, right? So sometimes I meet with families where they've got a really sharp student. Um, they've done really interesting things with their high school time frame, and they list off all the schools that you might think about, right? Those schools that were in the top part of my school list earlier. And then when we get to the, how are we paying for college? The first thing out of their mouth is we would like scholarships. And what they don't know is none of those schools offer merit scholarship dollars. Because if I'm a school that has an acceptance rate of 3%, 7%, 14%, even 19%, where's the incentive to give away money? Colleges are businesses. If they're gonna give away cash, they need to get something back in return. It's the way they think, right? And so if I have way more applicants than I've got space for, there's no incentive for me to give away money and consequently they don't. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind. So once you know if a school is gonna give away merit scholarship dollars and their acceptance rate is a primary way that you'll understand that, what are they looking for? Well, um, you wanna look for schools where your students' numbers are slightly above the incoming average for that college, right? So find out what the average is at the school you're looking at and where does my student align, right? So if you have the three, six kid, you wanna look for schools where the average incoming is about a three, four, three, five, something like that, right? Cause that puts your student above, helps the school with their incoming average money on the table. Extracurricular talents matter, but not in the way most families think, right? Your kid doesn't have to have more. More is not better here. Um, and also their um, extracurricular activities could be anything. It should reflect them. If they're not the sport kid, you don't need to have a sport. If they're not the arts kid, don't have an arts on there, right? Um, it should just reflect who they are. And then lastly, be demographically interesting. This is so easy to do. So easy and the cozy Whitmans of the planet totally cut ourselves off from this if we're not careful. You are most interesting to colleges outside your region, right? UVA has all the Virginia applicants they could ever want, right? If you live in Texas, University of Dallas has all the Dallas and Texas applicants they could ever want. This is true in every region. Most kids don't go more than 100 miles from their house to go to school, right? So you are interesting if you step out of your region and go somewhere else, because all the colleges want to be able to say, we've got one student from all 50 states and 37 countries around the world. And if you doubt me, go out to their college website today. This afternoon, pick any college. It doesn't matter which one. And there is information about how demographically um, diverse their campus is just in terms of where kids come from. All right, so I wanna walk you through how colleges think. This is the recipe card from one college, but these categories are extremely common. So I wanna share them with you today. So first things first, schools are thinking about how likely am I to be able to reel a student in and put them in a chair? And one way that your student can help them figure that out is by interacting with them. That's what demonstrated interest is. Every school awards a different amount for this, right? Um, some schools don't have this category, but most do. Um, and so they're just trying to figure out like who's most interested in me. And then any way you can help demonstrate that is good. 
look at this. If you live out of state, um, up to 15 grand a year, right? Those rare kids getting a lot more money. The next few categories are all about being really likely to be successful on a college campus. Colleges are looking for kids that they will keep off the academic probation records, right? Um, they're looking for kids who can be successful. And that's what those next four categories are all about. The next two are just about filling out your financial aid form. So sometimes people say to me like, look, we're not gonna qualify for need. What's the point? Well, the point is at some schools, you actually get merit scholarship money. It's not based on the outcome of the form, but the fact that you filled it out. That's how important that information is to the school. Think about it this way. If they haven't seen a FAFSA from you, they have no understanding of your ability to pay. And then a really well-written essay can be worth quite a bit of money, um, up to $8,500, $9,000, $10,000 at some schools. We spend a ton of time with our kids on their essays because at the end of the day, how you tell your story does matter. All right, so I wanna walk through testing. There's a lot of question about testing today, and then I'll take your questions. Um, so today, ACT, SAT, the colleges don't care which of the two tests you take, right? So some kids take whatever their local high school is giving out. Just know you could do either of these and the schools will be just fine with whatever test you decide to take. Um, there is no um, geographic hold on these tests any longer. So choose the test that serves your student best. They are different from one another. And so figuring out which one might be their better test benefits your student. The SAT went digital as of 2024. So it is an online test today. And if your student's a good online test taker, this could be a really good test for them. If they are not, then I would choose the ACT, which is remaining, at least for the time being, a booklet test. Get prep that fits your student, right? So again, if they're a good online learner, you can use some of the online tools. If they're not though, I would highly recommend looking in your community for some ACT or SAT prep. This could be um, small group or individual. The one way I wouldn't recommend people prep here is um, getting books and just doing it themselves. We haven't seen that to be a very productive way to prep for the tests. And then you can make the decision about sending your test scores after you're done taking your test, right? We recommend kids take the test a couple of times, get some good prep, and then you're good. When you register for these tests, they prompt you often to put in the schools you're interested in. We recommend leaving that blank until you are done. All right, Sarah, do we have any questions? We do have one question. So do extracurriculars count if they are not affiliated with the high school? For instance, my daughter does competition cheerleading, but the cheer gym is not associated with her school. Yeah, this is such a good question. Thank you for asking it. Yes. Um, here's the other thing. It doesn't have to be sport or activity related. Maybe your student just works, right? But they work their butt off and they're a really hard worker and they've been at the same business for three years, right? That says all kinds of things about your student to the school. So in the activities area, the colleges care about anything your student is doing. It's not just school related activities, right? So um, think hard about kind of what represents them and that's what should make it into the activity section. And it could be volunteering. That's completely unschool related. Um, another question, do step parents income count? Yeah, good question, yes. So the questions on the FAFSA are household income. So I'll use my own um, example, our own life as an example. Um, I was remarried, my ex-husband was not. And so consequently his household income was a little bit less. Um, we split at the time, uh, there were, were different criteria for choosing the household, right? But um, even in the current criteria, he was definitely doing more of the financial support than I was doing. And so we chose him to fill out our FAFSA. Um, so there was only one household income on there. Excellent. No more questions that I see. Um, if anybody has a question, feel free to type it in. Um, we can just move forward. And then if we have time at the end, then Cozy, we can address those questions at the end. Yeah, sounds good. All right. So I want to walk through some of the trends, some of the behavior changes that we're seeing on the parts of the college. And some of these things are making acceptance harder 
And anytime acceptance to a school gets harder, guess what happens? The cost of college also gets higher. So I wanna start with the test optional landscape. Test optional started as um, uh, something that colleges recognized as, you know, not every student is a great test taker. There were about a thousand schools prior to the pandemic who were test optional that just made this conscious choice that the test is not the be all end all. Um, during the pandemic, however, um, in the heart of the pandemic, uh, kids could not get tests. The sites were closed. And so a bunch of other schools just stepped into the landscape of test optional to say, we are also going to be test optional because we recognize people can't get tests. Well, what ended up happening um, is that a lot of the schools have stayed in that space and the test optional landscape has given people the impression that the schools don't care about the tests anymore. And so kids aren't taking the test or the ones that are due are just not submitting their test. It isn't great, right? But what it's done is driven up application numbers. We've seen a 30% increase in application numbers overall since 2020, 30%, that is unheard of. Prior to the pandemic, numbers were starting to tip down, right? Everybody was talking about this cliff that's coming uh, for, the, for the colleges. And um, what's happened since is numbers have skyrocketed. And so consequently, when application numbers go up, guess what happens to acceptance numbers? Because the freshman class sizes aren't changing. And so acceptance numbers go down. When acceptance rates go down, now you see all kinds of behavior changes from the colleges. Um, the first thing that we saw happen is many of the schools started to lean into early decision. So these were people who said, I am coming no matter what, right? I'm coming, you are my top choice school. I'm making this decision. That's why it's called early decision. In the fall, I'm not gonna wait to see other people's offers, I'm coming. Colleges love this because it, of course it helps them figure out who their freshman class is. It doesn't really value though, um, uh, families, uh, not from a financial perspective. Now, if you don't care so much about the cost of college, right, you've saved well, you're high net worth family, um, you might choose to op opt in to early decision at your top school, but you always want to figure out like what percentage of their freshman class come out of early decision because they vary widely, right? So Cornell takes 10%, 10 to 13% of freshman class out of early decision. Wake Forest last year took 58%. So if you're going to use an early decision option because you only get to use it one time, choose a school where it actually helps your student, right? Um, but the other thing about early decision is you put all your eggs in a basket and the school is not worried about losing you. And so consequently, we see that most people pay a little bit higher price at their early decision schools than they might have otherwise. The other thing I want to point out is that if you are looking at the more selective schools, and um, there are schools that have just become more selective in the last three years, um, the tier twos are good examples, Boston College, BU, Northeastern, Tulane, Case Western, Wake Forest. These schools have cut their acceptance rates in almost half. So schools normally 20 to 30% acceptance are now down at 10 and 15%. Well, when my acceptance rate drops, to 11%, I don't have to give away money anymore. And that's exactly what we've seen is that we've seen the scholarship dollars at those schools dry up and there really is not money at available at those schools any longer. Now, it may not stay that way, but that's certainly what we're seeing today. And then the other thing I just wanna point out is for the schools that really truly are test optional, the University of California school system went test blind and have stayed test blind during COVID. Um, that um, secondary factors influence then um, acceptance rates, things like the rigor level of your student's transcript, um, that demonstrated interest piece, right? You interacting with that school, um, things like their essay, all of those things are influencing acceptance. And the other thing we're seeing is that a lot of schools are looking now for that passion project, that internships and kind of research project, service project, something that sets the student aside. Do all schools need that? No. But do schools that have acceptance rates under 20% or under even 30% need that? Yes. So it's important to start to think about what do you want that to look like? And then the last thing I just want to point out is mentioned um, scholarships are drying up 
at the schools where they've seen just a flood of applications. The other thing we see in general is that um, prices are continuing to rise. During COVID, there was a lot of discussion around um, you know, the cliff that's coming. And I'm sure it is because we're having fewer kids and some kids are opting out because of the cost of college and some are opting out because guess what? I could choose other options now. I don't have to go to college. I could trade school. I could join um, uh, a union. So I think that's great. I'm not a college bigot. I don't think all kids need to go to college. But if your students headed off to college, you should just know in this last year, we saw eight to 16% increases in tuition on average. So prices are starting and continuing to rise. Uh, a lot of schools froze during COVID, froze their tuition, but now they're making up for that freezing. All right, my third tip for you, make college more of a business choice. The colleges are, it's a business decision for them. It's not personal, right? They're not looking at your student going, that Mary, she's so sweet. It's okay if she doesn't have quite the GPA we're looking for. We'll just bring her on board. She's so awesome. They are not thinking like that. They are businesses, right? They're going to think like a business. And I want you to do that too. It doesn't have to be 100% a business decision, of course, right? But what I mean by that is it's not just about the financials, right? I think um, in this presentation, we spend a lot of time on the financials, but good college search includes those other two categories, academic and social, so assure the school teaches for your students' success. Colleges are not a monolith. They don't all teach the same way. I had two students in my family who were better hands-on learners, candidly. They went to programs that were more hands-on so they could be successful. Make sure you're giving your students uh, multiple options to elbow through a couple majors, because everybody does, 80% of kids change their degree at least once. So just play the odds, right? If your student wants to be an engineer, great. Just know that's the number one change major. And what is plan B then, right? What if you get into this program and it's not really your thing, right? What would be plan B at this school so they don't have to pick themselves up and go to an another college increasing the cost of that degree? And then as mentioned, the big brand selective schools need your student to be more than smart. You cannot smart your way into the Ivies. You can't smart your way into Stanford any longer, right? You have to have more. Those projects, internships, that kind of stuff, right? It has to be. It's not enough to have just started a club at your local high school, right? That's not enough for these schools. UCLA had 146,000 applicants last year, 146,000 for 10,000 spots, right? Columbia had 80,000 applicants last year, right? These are the numbers we're seeing. It's not gonna be enough for your kid to be the 4.36 or the 4.1600. Then my last tip for you, so get your questions ready, create a family philosophy to pay for college. What do I mean by that? I mean, figure out what the four-year game plan is for paying for school, and then what's the budget? This is such a good conversation for you to have with your VLP advisor, right? Because they've got your long game. Nobody wants anybody tapping into retirement, right? It's a terrible plan. So start to figure out, like, how much can we afford on an annual basis for college? And then define expectations for the people who are paying. So we're going to bring X to the table. We want you to bring X to the table. And by the way, grandma has a 529 plan. If you don't know what's in grandma's 529 plan, it's time to have that conversation, right? Tell grandma, we're trying to build the budget. And then talk about it early in the process, right? One of the biggest mistakes that we see that people make is they take their kid to tour the luxury car, right? They take them out for a test drive there. But what they really wanna pay for is the Chevy Malibu, right? Don't go look at schools that you can't really afford because of course your student's gonna fall in love with those schools, right? So have that discussion first, then go out and seek out schools that fit the budget. So a little bit about us and I'm gonna drop into the chat a link that allows you to get a copy of the presentation if you want it, um, but you can also um, connect with me and we can do a consultation around your specific needs. This is a pretty good presentation it hits on the highlights, right? But it may not have spoke to everything about your particular college search. So I'll drop that in the chat here in a second. College Inside Track just helps families find right 
fit schools. You can do it yourself, but candidly, the way the colleges behave, their lack of transparency, just makes it really hard for people to understand what they're getting into. We do help families navigate the entirety of the process. When we work with families, that 38% acceptance rate, or excuse me, transfer rate drops to less than 4%. We're really focused on fit. We can ensure the schools that make it to the list meet your budget and that you get the best prices they have to offer. But here's my favorite thing we do. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I have five kids, four are girls. They have all mastered the eyeball role and I am never the smartest person in the world, never. So we get to be that neutral third party for your kids. So as mentioned, here's the coolest thing I wanna to offer to do. I do these every single day except Sunday. I love sitting down and chatting college with families. It is bar none the, my favorite part of my job. I think high schoolers are amazing. And when you give them good information, guess what? They make good decisions. So what are we gonna do in our hour? Um, we are gonna, um, you're gonna bring your questions to the table and uh, I'm gonna get them answered for you. Um, so um, we're gonna talk through those three areas that I mentioned, and I'll talk about goals and strategies in those three areas. So um, if your student is kind of in the like, I don't know how to think about this, the consultation's a great time to get them some ways to start to think about it. I can give you a rough of the outcome of the FAFSA if you like, and we'll talk about kind of your best pathways for scholarship dollars, if that's something you're interested in. And if you're most interested in, hey, you mentioned those extra projects, what does that actually look like? We can talk about that as well. So a little bit of housekeeping, I did drop that um, Google form into the chat. So if you have a sophomore or junior, let's chat, right? Um, take advantage of the consultation. It's free. It's fun. Students find it relieving candidly and so do parents. So just grab that form, fill it out, and then my admin will reach out and get you on my calendar. Maybe you joined us, you've got an eighth or ninth grader, you're like, oh, cozy there, I'm not ready. Um, nope, you're right, they're not. <laughs> so um, fill out the form anyway. We'll reach out when it's time appropriate, usually second half of sophomore year. And then do follow us on Facebook. We put a ton, a ton of content out on our Facebook page. It's just College Inside Track on Facebook. Um, my colleague Heather just wrote an article on um, the arts as healing um, degrees, right? So um, art therapy, music therapy, those kinds of things. We just did one business school for B students. There's a ton of information out there. So feel free to go out to the Facebook page and, and capture it and share us with people you know if you join today because you have a high schooler, you know other parents with high schoolers, either share that Google form with them, just give them my name. <clears throat> if you have lots of people and you would like to just give them this information, we can sit down and chat about what that looks like as well. Uh, but don't keep it to yourself. I'm here to tell you families are stressed and I'm happy to relieve the stress of anybody you love and care about. All right, Sarah, let's take our last round of questions. Okay, I'm looking at the chat box. I don't see anything coming into the chat box. Um, if anybody does have any last minute questions, go, go ahead and type that into the chat box or feel free to unmute your line. Um, totally fine to do that and, and ask your question out loud. <clears throat> Remember, if you're thinking it, there's probably somebody else in the room that's also thinking it. Um, so don't be shy. Come forward with those questions. <clears throat> All good. Quite yeah. a sense I've had in weeks. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Sometimes people's head are, are just spinning. They're like, oh my gosh, that was so much information. Yeah, it is a lot of information, but I, you know, I learn something new every single time I watch your presentation. So you've been doing this for several years for us. Um, I always pick up another nugget or two of information that's really helpful that I kind of put in my back pocket. <clears throat> Um, so thank you so much, Cozy, for um, for presenting today. Um, we we really appreciate it. Um, and I know it's helpful to all of our clients. Um, thanks to all of you for joining today. Uh, I do want to mention that um, next time, our next webinar is uh, March 28th. It's on a, a generational wealth transfer. So please join us for that if you can. Um, again, thank you all for joining and we will see you next time. And thank you again, Cozy. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and thanks everybody for carving time out. Enjoy the rest of your week. All right.
Thank you. Bye-bye. You bet. Bye-bye.